Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, welcoming you to the first installment of the Orchestration Book Club. In this series of videos, I'll be introducing you to some of the great books out there that are helpful, instructive, and even inspirational for orchestral composers. Some books will be biographical, historical, even humorous, but we'll mostly focus on books that reveal the process of orchestration, composition, and orchestral performance. This is definitely a series in which feedback is much appreciated, especially if you follow up and read the book as well and want to share your take on it. You can comment on the Facebook Orchestration Online group, which is great for starting a conversation, or leave a comment here on the YouTube view page. The best way to get a sense of what's in a book is to hear a sample, and that's just what I plan to do. Read a page or two for you now, so you know whether it's worth tracking the book down yourself. The first book we're going to cover is the fairly rare but not unavailable book, The Elements of Orchestral Arrangement by William Lovelock, published in 1969 by G. Bell and Sons. There are a few copies of this remarkable book out there on sites like Amazon and Biblio, and possibly in your public library or university. Right at the start of the book, he tells you exactly what it's about. The second sentence of the foreword reads, My aim is to help the examination candidate and others who are concerned with arranging passages or pieces for orchestras of varying sizes and constitution. So it's not a book about composing for orchestra. Instead, he wants to show you the basic principles of expanding an existing work to orchestral proportions. Then, in a brief three-page first chapter, he lays down some ground rules about orchestration along with the kind of perspective that comes with many years of first-class work at the top of the field. I'll read you the best bits now, so you get a sense of where he's coming from. After picking this book up for the first time a while back, I found it all eerily familiar. Before embarking on the study of orchestration in any shape or form, it is essential for the student to have a thorough knowledge of harmony and counterpoint. This may seem an obvious statement, but it is prompted by not infrequent experience of the would-be pupil who wants to learn to write for orchestra. When a few simple questions prove that he barely knows, if he knows at all, how to write a simple cadence correctly, the student who cannot write a decent piece of four-part harmony has precious little chance of scoring effectively for even a small string band. Counterpoint, of course, does not imply the strict variety, assuming that anybody still teaches or studies that pernicious form of academic narrow-mindedness, but rather an understanding of good, interesting part writing and the ability to put this understanding to practical use. Since this book is of deliberately limited scope, it is not proposed to deal with the technique of the various instruments. This and all relevant information should be studied in some comprehensive tome, such as Forsyth's Orchestration, which is available in any good library. Intensive study of such a book is essential, but it should be supplemented as far as possible by practical acquaintance, however limited, with at least some of the instruments. Much, too, can be learned from an hour or two spent with a good player who can demonstrate how his instrument is handled, and what it can do effectively and what it cannot. Mental hearing, the ability to hear what one sees on paper, and to imagine the tone qualities of the various instruments is of vital importance and little of any progress is possible unless it is well developed. Too often one finds a student assigning a passage to an instrument to which it is not only unsuited technically, but on which it will sound inappropriate. A fanfare-like passage will sound merely silly on a couple of flutes. A soft melody involving a lot of ledger lines will be impossible on a clarinet, and if attempted, is likely to sound quite horrible. Study of the scores of works by acknowledged masters of the orchestra, e.g. Tchaikovsky, Elgar, Rimsky, Korsakov, teaches one an enormous amount, and even more can be learned by following performances, whether live or recorded, with scores. 
In some respects, the use of the gramophone is really the best, since one can always stop the turntable and rehear a passage as many times as desired. Attendance at rehearsals under good conductors is invaluable. Apart from the opportunity it gives of studying how they dissect works and mold them to the interpretation they have in mind. The student should be continually trying to hear in his mind the sounds of different instruments, associating them with melodies or passages with which he is familiar. Try, for example, to hear the opening melody in the slow movement of Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony with the proper horn tune. the C-sharp minor theme of the second movement of Schubert's Unfinished on the clarinet. The opening of the slow movement of Beethoven's seventh with the somber tone of the lower strings. and so on. And then, if you have a gramophone, play the passage and check the accuracy of your imagination. Try, too, mentally comparing one instrument with another. For example, the clear white tone of the flute's middle register with the reediness of the oboe, and that with the creamy smoothness of the clarinet. The compass of every instrument must be memorized, though admittedly one may need to look up and check that of a comparatively rarely used instrument such as the glockenspiel. The student will find it helpful to make a chart of compasses, starting with the strings and adding to it as he begins to deal with the other instruments, and have it in front of his eyes when working. The beginner, especially if he be pianist or organist, finds it all too easy to write above the compass of even such a common instrument as the violin. A special warning may be given here regarding the use of upper registers. On many instruments, the higher we go, the more difficult the tone control becomes, and fingering too. We have to bear in mind not only what is possible, but also what is practical. Because the textbook says that the clarinet can ascend as far as five ledger line C above the treble staff, it does not mean that this highest range may be safely used ad lib. That is, unless you deliberately want a noise like the last shriek of a lost soul. Similarly, the horn, whose top note for normal purposes is sounding third space C, can reach as high as F a fourth above. The ill-advised student, possibly having listened carefully to Strauss's Till Eulenspiegel, takes the horn up to this limit quite casually and probably marks it piano. He does not realize what any player could tell him quickly, and probably pungently enough, that a. such a note is a considerable strain on the lips, b. its effectiveness is in inverse proportion to the frequency of its use, and c. it can only be taken forte or fortissimo anyway. Another matter which needs careful thought is that of technical difficulty. If you've arranged your work to be played by, say, the London Symphony Orchestra, or the BBC Symphony Orchestra, not, admittedly, a very probable happening, then you may, if you choose, write in terms of a band of virtuosi. But even so, there is no need to write a lot of passages which will cause the players to curse rather than to bless you. Don't think in terms of a crack orchestra, rather the reverse. A final point of the utmost importance when arranging for orchestra is that we are dealing with musical sounds, not merely black dots on paper. This obvious remark arises from what was said earlier with regard to mental hearing. The student must have as clear an idea as possible of what his score will sound like. It is not a matter of transcribing one lot of notes on the printed page as another lot of the same pitch in some kind of orchestral score. The student must be continually and continuously asking himself whether what he has written is apt, playable, and effective. Is this the right color for this melody? Is my chord spacing effective in orchestral terms? Am I writing in a truly orchestral idiom, or am I merely trying to make the orchestra sound like a piano? 
and so on. After this introduction, he takes you on a guided tour of different orchestrations of piano pieces by Schumann, Beethoven, and Debussy, going section by section through the orchestra. It's the kind of book that fills the huge gap left by most orchestration books, which are largely just instrumentation manuals. Here, Lovelock goes through every detail of arranging, illustrating in a very engaging and easy-to-read style the exact application of those instruments. He also gives assignments for your own attempts, or for a class if you were an orchestration student. The style doesn't quite get past the era of English pastoralist composers like Vaughan Williams or Delius, of whose work Lovelock was a follower. But you couldn't go wrong here as an introduction to orchestral arranging, no matter what direction you eventually develop. Lovelock felt that the first duty of a composer was to not bore your audience, and he lives up to that commandment here in these pages. The next installment of the Orchestration Book Club will cover the secret lives of those poor individuals whose job it is to bring your score to life. Join me next time as we look at one of the great comedy classics of 19th century music, Evenings with the Orchestra by Hector Berlioz. Hope to see you there. <laughs>